Hi, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Charlotte Higgins. I'm the chief culture writer of The Guardian. Um, I've written about the BBC um, in my time, so I have a, apart from writing about culture, I've written about the media. And it's my huge pleasure to welcome you to the Almeida, to London's best theatre and my local, um, for this event about fake news. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before I introduce the panel. We're going to go on until about quarter two. And at about 25 to, we will open up this debate to you. So please do bear that in mind and have, have your questions ready and waiting. Um, our panel tonight, on my immediate right is James Ball, um, who has worked uh, at The Guardian, he's worked at The Washington Post, uh, he is an investigative reporter of Repute, uh, was part of a reporting team that won a Pulitzer Prize for public service, and he's now a reporter at BuzzFeed, and he's also the author of Terribly Good Book, Plug, Post Thank Truth, you. <laughs> just out. Slipped a ten quid before we went on, <laughs> worth every penny. Um, next to him is Sheila Burnett, who uh, went to art school in Birmingham and came to London in 1969, where she got a job on The Sun, when The Sun was a young, uh, thrusting young newspaper. And she worked in The Sun's art department for four years, and then went on to have a very different career um, in theatre as a performer, and um, is now a theatre photographer. On, his, on her immediate right is Jonathan Chanin, who um, started his career in journalism as a fact-checker on The New Yorker, so very relevant to tonight's discussion of post-truth and fake news, um, has worked in Abu Dhabi and in India, and is now the editor of um, the Long Read section at The Guardian. And the principal reason, he's actually my editor at The Guardian, um, the principal reason I invited, I, I thought he would be a great idea to be on the panel, is that he's in the middle of writing an article about fake news and post-truth, which he assured me would have appeared by tonight. But unlike his diligent writers, he, um, uh, he's slightly worse at deadlines than I am. Um, um, one of the purposes of tonight, well, the, the purpose of the event, as I see it, is to... Think a little bit about, um, well, we, we, the, the event is billed as an event about fake news, and that's sort of what we want to discuss, but we, we want to draw a thread from um, the play that you're going to see tonight, whose setting is 1969-1970, The Origins of the Sun. Um, to think about that context, and about how the world has changed, or perhaps hasn't, and um, how we've ended up in this uh, media era that we find ourselves in now, where... There is a huge amount of discussion, anxiety, possibly even moral panic about the notion of fake news, um, the era of post-truth when an, an American president um, can you know, lie and seemingly get away with it, um, so far has got away with it. Um, so I would like to start by asking Sheila, who's just switching off her phone, sorry, bad time, <laughs> <laughs> call you out there. Um, Sheila, can you set the scene for us of, of, of our starting point for this discussion, which is the, the, the sun at its, at its very start? What was, it, what was it like to pitch up there as a, in your early 20s? This was your first job. You'd moved to London, and you were in the sun's art department. How was, what was it like? Well, it was 1969, which is a brilliant year to have moved from Birmingham to London because of the concerts in Hyde Park and man landing on the moon, and all that kind of stuff. And so there was um, an advert looking for a young team of people for this new newspaper, which I answered. I got the job. And the, the paper that it originally was was the Herald, which is a, um, a left-wing newspaper. My boss, also his name, Ron Saxby, also worked on the Herald. And that's how it started. Um, can you give us a sort of sense of... I mean, in my mind, 1969 to 1970, it's a great... It's a time of... It was before I was born, so forgive me, but it's a time of great excitement. There's a kind of a huge cultural shift occurring in terms of the age of deference is looking quite shaky. Um, youth culture is exploding. Um, and yet, at the same time, 
there was still a culture of trust in institutions, still a culture of trust in the police, in the well, art. It, yeah, yeah, it's kind of like an age of innocence, from what mm. I can remember. I, I mean, if it said something in the newspapers, well, it, would, it wouldn't occur to me to think that it wasn't. And it's like the same with doctors, and they were right, and you just trusted them, because there was never any reason not to. But there was usually only one form of news, it was the radio, the television, and the newspapers. As simple as that. It didn't come from anywhere else. And there was no mobile, no mobile phones, and we actually didn't have any mobile phones. And d what did you? What was your impression as you saw the Sun develop um, and mature as a newspaper? Um, was there a palpable sense at the time that it really was changing the basis on which newspapers were being made? Not for me, well, because I, I, there's a bunch of artists uh, from art school in Birmingham. We all came down together, and. Um, my friend, my best friend, got a... Uh, I don't know if anybody would know Oz magazine. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So he worked on Oz magazine, and I worked at The Sun. And so we kind of had a few jokes about that. In fact, he even tried to get me some headed note paper, and I can't remember whether I got him any or not. But I really can't remember. But the thing is, Oz and Suck magazine were far more outrageous. Whereas at the time, the, u the usual red top papers were supposed, they were just the papers that ordinary people, not ordinary people read of. I mean, they were just the standard newspapers. And did you have a sense of whether the sun, you know, how the sun handled news? How, did it feel like it was telling the truth since we're talking about fake news? Well, I can tell you what my first job was. Because nudity in those days, well, my first job, I promise you faithfully, until page three came out, was cutting out the little squares that went over the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really did. I mean, those, they had to be really precise as well, you know, with a, a Stanley blade and a, a steel ruler. <laughs> I cut those out. And so the, the, the photographs would come to me, and I'd measure them out. And put the, that's what I did. <laughs> and um, how different, yes, anyway. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, it's really. an intriguing first job. And, um, and do you remember, I mean, I suppose one thing that one could say is that putting, putting uh, a semi-naked woman on page three of a newspaper, and page three traditionally is a sort of really meaty heart of, you know, you've got the front, with the splash, the cover, and then page three was, is, still is, the sort of prestige slot of, of any newspaper. It's, it's where you get the first big meeting article of the run. Um, can you remember how it was when page three yes, was inaugurated? I can. Tell us all about it, it was, I mean, it was, it, because my mum and dad, they always used to get the sketch. That was their newspaper, but because their daughter started... Does everyone remember the sketch? Because I, sketch. it's one of those new, old... Uh, it was a really yes, old fashioned. It had Blondie and Dagwood on the back. Hmm? Downmarket version of the mirror. Yes, yeah. that's right, but yeah. that's what my mum and dad always had for some reason, I don't know why. But then they, they, they swapped to the sun. And, uh, <laughs> and it was fine for a year. <laughs> and then, then I remember, the mon was it a Monday or Tuesday? I don't know, I opened it and saw page three. I was, I was appalled. I was just so upset. Not for me, but because my mum and dad <laughs> would be opening their paper at breakfast and seeing... Uh, I mean, it was quite a tasteful picture compared with how they went on to become, you know. But my dad was still reading the paper 40 years later. I mean, he didn't... St I thought that they would stop the paper just there and then, but... But didn't. surprisingly enough, a man did not seem to read the newspaper because it started. Uh, no, I was bored, really. <laughs> but so you weren't, you weren't there in the room when it was being discussed. It came as a kind of surprise. It came as an absolute yeah, surprise, surprise because, you know, we'd get into work in the mornings. We'd all have the papers on that, our desk and just flip, flick through because I used to do the cartoons as well. I was so it was, it was, was kept under a certain amount of... Secrecy, in fact, I think. Which? The, pe the inauguration of page three, but we must... Yes. Right. right. But anyway, the, but yeah. anyway it's... Yeah. 
So this, I think, serves as a very um, vivid introduction to a kind of a time that seems to have been possibly distant, in fact, when people were still manually cutting out uh, little squares for a, a kind of very, what seems now a sort of forgotten pre-digital production process of a newspaper. Um, James, how, where have we got to? What's changed? Well, Give us a quick historical fast forward. So we can uh, block them out on Photoshop now, which is a lot quicker. Um, <laughs> but you don't need to. So I think it's kind of easy to suggest it's the internet that's changed everything and, you know, clickbait and fake news and that's bad. But a lot more of what's gone on has kind of been some things staying the same but now not requiring trees to die and some things changing. And the things that I think have stayed the same is that tabloid headlines have always been grabbier than broadsheet ones. You know, however much we might like to think about news culture, you know, today the Daily Mail and the Sun outsell the Guardian by about 15 to 1 and the Times by about 9 to 1. Um, and that's less than they used to. Um, you know, the sort of tabloid story, the celebrity, the gossip has always been the thing that we've, as a public, gone for. And I'll be honest, from being at The Guardian and being at BuzzFeed, I know every sort of opinion poll that we do, every survey that we do, people say they want more serious news, more, ba more balance, less comment. Definitely not of that celeb stuff. No gossip, <coughs> thank you very much. Um, I see the page numbers. We know what you actually look at. <laughs> So, yes, that's a very guilty little laugh there, guys. So, um, and that's kind of been how every news organisation works in its own way. It's a mix of fun and it's a mix of serious stuff. And the risk of the internet is that it unbundles it. And so the tricky thing for us has been what's happened with it. And, you know, the size of the newsrooms that you had in the 60s and 70s were huge. Like, a reporter could go out, get wildly drunk at lunchtime, phone in their copy to someone who would type up their slurred quotes... Um, then a sub-editor would basically, on tabloids, write their news story for them. Um, a copy, a different editor would then whack the headline and the furniture and the pictures on it, and it would go out. And it sounded great. I mean, the thing I mainly miss is getting wildly drunk at weekends. I was, uh, at lunch times, I was born too late. Um, but now it's in an incredibly thin process. There are fewer reporters having to turn out more stuff. And... If we're honest, it takes a long time to check something out. It takes a long time to actually find out something new. Most of what you read is something the government has put out and a news organisation has put its spin on and tailored it to you as an audience. That's not a malevolent process. It's going, hey, here's some health statistics. What's most interesting to a Guardian reader? What's most interesting to a male reader? And there'll be different things. Neither is fake, but actually saying something that the world wouldn't find out otherwise is expensive, it takes longer, and it doesn't get more views. And so for places that are chasing the bottom, chasing the click money, it does tempt the tabloid, it tempts the lurid, and it tempts the fake. And so that's why sometimes I think we think the sort of fake news problem or the grabby problem is an internet problem. It's kind of a resources problem, and it's kind of an us problem. Partly, we get the media we deserve. And I'm quite glad lots of places pay for good reporting still, because it's not always in their financial interest, but I like being hired. <laughs> the, but there's always been... I, I mean, I suppose what makes me slightly anxious about that, that sort of brilliant elucidation of 40... A very difficult question of mine, sorry. Is, Tell um, the media history of 40 years. I know, oh, you're up to it. Um, is that there's always, but there's always been lazy and credulous reporting... Um, and there's always been, you know, wrong stuff has always been reported. And I suppose in the context of The Sun, um, and ev every newspaper would have some example, but probably, I'm afraid, The Sun uh, created the most egregious example, which is the uh, credulous reporting of what the police told them about Hillsborough, um, which, by some definition, you could argue was fake news yeah. uh, of the 1980s. Um, it's, it's not the real. It's, it's the real change, possibly that. And this is why I was keen to ask Sheila about trust. <laughs> was that um, generally, culturally, we are in a less trusting culture, and in a less a, a culture that where the authority of the very few newspaper, you know, there was the BBC, the ITV, and there were big newspaper organisations that 
actually had the machinery, the means and the distributive um, possibilities to get newspapers around the country. And that has been completely unleashed, of course, by the internet. But I think if you look at the things that have eroded trust, it's actually rarely been that the bloggers exist, that the hyper-partisan things exist, that the fake stuff do. They move in when there's a gulf of trust. And there's a gulf of trust partly because a lot of the elite haven't learned how to talk to the public now, and a lot of the ones who have are outright bullshitters. Um, I mean, the easiest way to produce fake news right now is to accurately report what the President of the United States says. Um, and that is the media of old. You report what someone says, they're a politician, mm. it's important the nation knows their views. Now you've got places like the New York Times adding, comma, lying to headlines or without evidence. Um, we also had a fairly unprecedented case of, you know, Politicians lying is not a new phenomenon. I'm, mm -hmm. I, I hate to break it to you guys. Um, but for something like the EU referendum campaign, we had a unique situation where the people who were making the claims were never going to be the ones who would be accountable for them. They were never going to be the people enacting Brexit. There was never going to be another vote sort of five years later to vote them out of office or to vote them. So people had this opportunity. Because they were a campaign, fit. not yeah. a party. Yeah. And that actually uses the media against it. Our instincts to, and in fact legal obligations on broadcasters to report all viewpoints, and that's a requirement during referenda and elections, they have to, means that that, that pledge ha comes out again and again despite efforts to fact check it. And you've got now very, very savvy PR operators, politicians, companies who can use sort of media's biases and media's sort of bias to establishment against it and that's quite dangerous. But the other thing is, you know, Boris Johnson went to Eton, went to Oxford, did PPE, was given a job by his family in the Times uh, through connections, then got a job at the Telegraph after being fired for putting fake news on the front page. So um, Boris was fired for his first job for fake news, true fact. So, um, you know, he is as establishment as they come and plays the outsider. Nigel Farage, a metals trader who has been employed at the taxpayer's expense for 20 years and hired his wife, outsider. And yet other politicians, other media looks like the insider because we still talk as if it's 1970 and everyone trusts us because we have terribly BBC accents. That was not remotely a, a BBC accent. Please imagine it was. So, um, and I think it, it sounds glib and awful, but I think there's a thing of once... It was about speaking from authority, trust us where the media. I think now we have to kind of learn how to sound authentic, how to sound human, and like try and back up and be trustworthy in a different way. I think that all, we're trying to sort of replay the 1950s until it works, and we keep getting shocked when it doesn't, and other stuff fills the gulf. And the stuff that moves in, the sort of bright parts of the world, the canaries to an extent, these kind of fringe sites do it because we've lost those audiences. Mm. They don't believe us anymore. Why is that, Jonathan? I mean, is, I mean this sort of gets us into <laughs> and this go, well, it gets us it gets us into really intriguing um, kind of philosophical territory in a sense about you know um, you know what is this this sort of truth and these great facts that we're, we're all in search of. I mean, any sort of rudimentary GCSE history student knows that an event looked at by two different people from two perspectives will will be recounted entirely differently. That's a sort of basic. Um, fact or truth. Um, there seems to be a, there's a moral panic around um, fake news, and I, and I wonder how you would kind of think yeah, about that or I, talk about that. I think that something, I mean, it's, I, I agree with what James is saying to a degree, that there is something, it's very hard in talking about this phenomenon to sort out what's new from what's not new, I think. Um, and, and some of what's new... I think existed in, in nascent forms previously, but wasn't quite as dominant or quite as frequent as we're seeing it now. And so it's kind of, you know, I was looking up earlier today, um, there's a wonderful book that's a history of the sun, which perhaps some of you have read, I know James has, uh, called Stick It Up Your Punter. Uh, uh, I highly recommend it, and it's, you know, uh, it's after seeing the play, you'll want to read it. Um, and and it, it narrates the the much later in the book, long after the events of the play, the the uh, process by which the famous Freddie Starr ate my hamster 
front page came to be produced. Um, and the story, I guess, was that there was a sort of bit of kind of showbiz lore that had been going around. To be honest, I don't know who Freddie Starr is, so you're all going to have to sort of sympathize with me here. <laughs> He's not from uh, here. <laughs> uh, I've only moved here three years ago. This is all sort of ancient history. Uh, it, it, where, you know, he had kind of put a hamster in a sandwich for real between two pieces of bread and pretended to eat it. Uh, and in order to, I think, scare maybe his girlfriend, his ex-girlfriend's daughter or something like that. I'm not going to remember this very well. But... What you see there that I think is interesting is that there's a way in which that headline is true because it is the case that perhaps, you know, the, the girlfriend or the daughter or whatever might have indeed exclaimed, Freddie Star ate my hamster. Um, so the, the way in which there was a kind of long tradition in journalism, which obviously was taken to a much greater extreme in the tabloid world, of kind of saying, look, everything we do is a kind of an approximation of what really happened. Uh, and different newspapers or different journalistic outlets are going to have different standards about how faithful, you know, nothing is going to be a perfect reproduction of what actually happened. But is it, do we, are we setting the bar at like 10% or are we setting the bar at like 90%? Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of the culture of tabloids, especially in this country, has been a little bit of like, well, look, we can be slightly economical with some of these things. Um, and we can, as long as something about this is true, and you could kind of defend it if someone said, hey, that's not right, um, you could get away with doing it. And I think one thing that has happened in this current sort of fake news panic is that journalists, and maybe James is speaking to this as well, I feel like most journalists, and, and maybe I'm being unfair to my comrades, think that journalism is sort of more scientific than it is. Although privately, I think we all realize that, you know, the actual process by which reality is turned into a reproduction in a newspaper leaves lots of things out. But that is not, that's just been that's cheeky, fake news. isn't no, it? No, of course. It's like, there's a, an, a headline I remember at the Sun, is yeah. the day I ate Nurse Judy. <laughs> I really remember that. It was, in was, what particular sense that, was that a, There was a terrible <laughs> air crash in the Alps, right? Terrible air oh, crash. God. And they survived by um. eating each other. But the one survivor, that's where the headline, the, the day, day I actually. ate Nurse Judy, is that... Apparently, but it's a true Not story. Not the most tasteful. <laughs> but, but then you see, it's like a, the truth, but it's not fake news. It's just. I think the crucial, the, the, the sort of. The, the sort of crucial thing, in a sense, is that journalism is a branch of showbiz in, in a curious way. Yeah. And it does. It, the, the templates in which most journalism uh, exists uh, are incredibly. Narrow. I mean, if you if you examine news stories, they're they're mostly written in you know you, you can analyze a news story first year kind of journalism student thing to do no doubt never trained at anything. Uh, you can see how the thing is put together, and there's this kind of mystery in the newsroom about and I would say this of our own newsroom probably any any newsroom um, about such and such is a good story, and it's rarely analyzed about why a story is a good story. It is supposed to be, I think, some kind of instinctual, kind of God-given kind of talent to identify what is a good story. And yet, the idea of a good story is, is clearly ideological. It's, it's clearly bounded on all sides by various strictures about... Although don't they're very internalised in most newsrooms. You'll, you'll often see journalists grudgingly agree, even if it's a story their outlet would never run, they would never run. It's like... Oh, well, I think it's a bit repellent. Like, I wouldn't have done it, but good story. <laughs> it's like you can tell it, you know it when you see it. I think The Sun, um, you would know this better than me, I think actually under Larry Lamb in the, the early era, I think they were known as Hey Doris moments. It's like, is, is this a story you could imagine someone call, reading the paper, calling over to their <laughs> friend and going, Hey, Doris, <laughs> see this. And there is that quality to something. You know, there is... You know, different papers, it's not... You know, I work in sort of corporate investigations and cyber and stuff. You're less likely to read something I do and go, hey, that's really... You know, hey, look, it's really good. This company's taken a billion-dollar bribe and it's really quite shocking. Um, <laughs> although I wish you would. Um, but I can remember, you know, we did... Um, 
we got the personnel records from Guantanamo Bay, and these were really harrowing, you know, mental health, the conditions, how they'd been picked up, and the sort of overall story was how these people who'd been sort of painted as the worst of the worst weren't. There was an 89-year-old with severe dementia who was doubly incontinent who'd been taken out there as a major terror threat. It's like, maybe not. Um, but again, think of the people I'm picking out. I've picked the shocking case. But the story in there that grabbed everyone, that got shared, that actually by far more than anything we put on the front page was, does everyone know those little Casio watches? There's probably someone with one, really cheapo watches. Um, they are the most common watch in the world. They are worth... Um, no one in this audience has a really cheap old watch. <laughs> Very so good I'm disappointed in you all. Like, uh, <laughs> surely someone watch. is. But, um, but they're the most common watch in the world because they cost about three pounds. Um, and they were found in some Al-Qaeda d- um, bombs as timing devices because they were a really cheap watch. The US government decided that that meant if someone was wearing one of those watches, it meant they were in Al-Qaeda. And in a training manual, it said, if someone's wearing this watch, bring them in. Um, And that obviously got read. You know, hey, your Casio watch means you're in Al-Qaeda. And we wrote it, and that was the thing that was most grabbed. And you can see that as a bad thing. You can kind of go, oh, but I wish I'd have read the serious human human rights stuff. It's like a lot of people did, and if you're interested, you've got to read that. But if you weren't, you were never going to read that long, involved story. But if you read my thing about the silly watch, you actually got the narrative I was trying to give you. You got that this wasn't the worst of the worst, that there were some weird decisions going on and there was some bad reasoning. And so the kind of hey, grabby bit, the hey, Doris thing has never quite bothered me. If I can use sort of finding the attention grabby bit to bring you into something I think is important, Mm. great. Like the title of your book. Uh, yes, yes. So Post good. Truth, How Bullshit Conquered the World in All Good Bookshops. So good that two <laughs> other authors had books out with almost the same title. On the same day, day. funnily Shocking. enough. Well, that bit, which is a, which is a, a kind of amazing um, reflection of, of, you know, this post-truth idea is as, as absolutely the idea of the moment. Um, so are we living in some kind of postmodern maelstrom, Jonathan, where there is no truth anymore? I mean, if... if, if, if I mean, you say politicians have always lied. Clearly, that is true. But I, I don't think. I think it would be quite hard to say that a politician had lied so consistently and so blatantly as um, Donald Trump. Yeah. What's I going on? Are we in well, the I world th- of alternative facts? I rel- think that one thing yeah. that's happening, which, which is sort of not commented on enough, is is that the speed at which information now moves has has broken. You know, the sense in which. Um, we all sort of, you know, you said that you used to live in kind of an age of trust, and we all sort of believed what was in the newspaper. Um, and the newspaper sometimes got it wrong, and maybe lots of people didn't believe what was in a given newspaper. But the newspaper came out once a day, and the television news was on, you know, five times a day, and the radio news was on 12 times a day, or however these things would go. And I think one of the things that has happened now is this sense that. To, to, to be punished for lying or to be valorized for telling the truth or to even have a sense of things that are true and false, we all have to have a kind of collective agreement on what the relevant facts are. So if someone is lying when they are saying something that doesn't correspond to reality, we can only identify them as having lied if we all basically say, oh, well, reality is this, and they said that. And I think one thing that the way journalism is implicated in some way in this post-truth world, or w- which, which it's not really, or whatever, is, something is happening now, obviously, we don't, have, we don't know what the name of it is, is, is that journalism, because it used to sort of be the only game in town in terms of telling you things about the world that you couldn't see out your own window, uh, sort of held that together, even if sometimes it was tabloidy, or sometimes it was wrong, or sometimes... It stretched the truth a bit, or sometimes it had an and agenda. And in our culture, we had the BBC as well. Yeah, I mean, I the, BBC, the BBC is the perfect example of this. Its trust numbers are still huge. Like, yeah. there's yeah. nothing like the BBC in America. America which well, I think that because I think often when we have this conversation about post-truth, there is a sense that oh, it used to be that you know facts were facts and lies were lies. And I think no, we've always known things on the basis of trust. We've kind of always understood that, well, if you hear something from a trustworthy source, then you believe it to be true. You know, most of the beliefs that we hold about the rest of the world 
aren't based on our firsthand experience. Of, you know, if you think communism was bad, it's not because you lived in the Soviet Union in 1986 or something. Um, so I think that the, the, what, what's happening now is that a sort of like solid ground that was a kind of place of common consensus of some sort, which never was as firm as we thought it was. I think it's one of the things that has come up a lot in this conversation is that there was always a lot of debate about what, about, you know, what were the real facts of the matter. But I think the speed that things move around now and the way that, you know, we, we, we look at, you know, Hillsborough maybe is, is, a, is a difficult example because the legacy of, of, of that contested version of events carried on for many, many, many years. But I think there was a sense in which, like, even a, a, a false or a, or a maliciously dishonest newspaper front page 30 years ago, uh, if no other newspapers picked it up, it, it goes away in a way. It, it doesn't, you know, it's, that's yesterday's news. And there's a way, I think, now in which something that's false can be repeated. I mean, we all have millions of examples of this. I mean, I think James was talking the other day about uh, there's a picture of Trump looking at Putin in, uh, you know, at some UN or at some G20 meeting or something like this, and, it, and Trump is sort of staring at Putin, and maybe all of you will have seen this on Twitter or on yeah. Facebook, and someone has photoshopped Putin into that picture. You know, in fact, it's like some Turkish guy or something who Trump is having a conversation with. Uh, but that's shared, you know, 200,000 times on Twitter. Um, <coughs> Uh, that kind of thing, I think, gets around so much faster than, than, it, than it used to be able to. And I think in the old days, when, you had, when journalists were the only game in town, even though sometimes we're a sort of less than admirable species, there was a way in which there was a professional norm against deliberate falsehood. So just, uh, and, and certainly you yeah. wouldn't repeat something if you definitely knew it to be false. So once one paper, you know, one paper had said something that's incorrect, it's not going to be picked up by another paper if it's been shown already to be false. Now, another paper might pick it up while sort of conveniently not yeah. trying to find out whether Freddie Starr ate the hamster or not, you know. Yeah. Just, just, just to yeah. offer a slight counter-narrative to that, though, I think part of the issue now is it's very hard for us to ignore what other people believe uh, when it used to be very easy. If you just lived in a village and bought one newspaper a day, it's very comfortable. You're surrounded by people like you who will largely think like you. You have a paper that thinks like you. It's like a warm bath of your own opinions. So, whereas now, for all that we shout about filter bubbles, we actually run, rub up against a lot more people that we don't know. And particularly, those of us in journalism run up against a lot of people who think very differently to us and think that we're very bad people for thinking like we do. That's not quite the language they use on social media. Um, and so I think there's this sense for us that somehow the public's got more credulous or that bad news spreads more often. And I think the sign through that in long history is sort of looking in conspiracy theory and folk history, which is as near as you would come to this stuff. And, you know, blood libel was born in the 11th century in uh, Norfolk, actually, as it happens. Mm. Um, you had witch hunts. You had the sort of terrible kind of... Uh, relentless sort of racial uh, rumours that there were gangs about to You'd rise up in America. You'd have that the Enlightenment could have But you, you then, in the 20th century, us, right? you had the moon landings were faked, you had the Kennedy mm, it, killing, you had 9-11, mm, which was see, the false social media. But in 1969, it wouldn't even occur to us to think that that was fake, you know. It, we just, everybody was really excited. Yeah, but I mean, that, I know, that myth it, existed before I was born, though. It, like... You know, aliens are being covered up in Roswell. All of this. Oh, right. oh, Conspiracy yeah, theories are run through the... You know, the, the JFK assassination. You know, the, the, uh, you know what I mean? The grassy knoll. That's the justice yeah. for the grassy knoll. So I, I think there is something in what James says. that There's a kind of, you know, maybe the internet in a sense has given more place to this sort of... Do you think the circulation of conspiracy? The the moon? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, I completely think that. But I mean, the, the You're theory. my innocence. I know, I completely believe it happened, but the conspiracy theory that it hasn't is older than the internet. Well, do you think that fake news now is more dangerous than fake news in the past? I guess That's the thing is question. with the past, Just we, know, we know it didn't lead to terrible consequences. I think fake information and conspiracy theories are dangerous at time of populism when they're used to fuel divisive agendas, when they're used to attack institutions. So if they're used by a leader to invalidate the courts, if they're used by a leader to 
invalidate the media and the fourth estate. That's when these narratives, you know, CNN is fraud news and stuff are dangerous. We know in the past when they worked and when they didn't, so it feels safe. We don't know right now where it's going to go, and it's easy to get too scared. You know, the public's more educated than they've ever been, they're reading more news than they've ever been from more sources. But the reason it feels scary now is we don't know what's going to happen next. The age of uncertainty. I'm very keen for the last five minutes of the event to bring you in. There's a question here. Thank you. Luke Gerstner, who's a CEO of IBM, he used to say, tell stories about IBM because there are no facts about the future. I'm just wondering if we're getting mixed up between facts and truth. Truth and belief have always been really closely linked. And that kind of idea that we're at the end of history and you know, evidence for that, that idea that we have the evidence-based policy was, and now we're actually in an era where, where people are wanting to tell something about the future and therefore, you know, and it's always, you know, it's always, I tell the truth, you're post-truth. It's I, I report the news, you're reporting fake news. And I just wonder if there's a, there's a problem there. In fact, what we should be talking about is a post-trust trust era, mm. where it's, I mean, it's, it's much more about individual, it's, individual kind of individuals yeah. believing their own stories is more important than anything else. It's interesting it's, what you say, because fake news has been weaponized. I mean, it, 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 almost as soon as the phrase was coined, Trump himself was using it as a weapon against news. So where does that, where does that leave us, Jonathan? Yeah, I think that there is a sense in which it's very easy to take advantage of the kind of... I know it's a slippery slope in a way, because it's sort of the, 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 the distinction between facts and stories, or facts and truth, is a, is a, it's a sort of slippery one, because th there's a way in which, you know, I don't know how to, I don't know how to express this, where, where it's kind of... It's, it's easy to think that facts speak for themselves and that, and that then also we tell stories about those facts. But I think the thing is, we only take on facts when they're part of stories, basically. You know, that, that you can't, you couldn't, I could, we couldn't produce a newspaper that's just full of numbers uh, and say, here you go, this is what happened in the world yesterday. Uh, no opinions went into the making of this thing. And I think part of what someone like Trump uh, is exploiting, and, and, and I don't think it's, is this idea that, you know, these things are all a bit wobbly, and, and if you can tell a good story, you know, we've known this for ages and ages, this is what public relations and advertising are about. And um, James has a very good example in his book, actually, about how um, Trump used the, you know, was a very good and dishonest PR operator, and he used to fuel rumours that uh, Prince Charles and Princess Diana were on the verge of buying apartments in uh, Mar Trump Tower, uh, yeah. Trump Tower um, which is a very easy thing to do because you can plant the seed of it and then the journalist calls up the palace and the palace never comments about anything, which means they're not denying it, which means they might be... So he, and he the was journalist a, he gets was a, a scoop. A master Trump of that in well, the I, th I think it used to. F I think it used to feel, either wrongly or not, like we could tell the difference between news, bullshit, spin politician speaking, right? There was a sense that kind of, you know... Yeah, I know, but I, I like think... I like to think I still can. Well, I think we are... <laughs> I think maybe each of I us... Really do. I think maybe each of us still feels that we can, but in a way, if, if everyone doesn't agree, that, right, if, if we all say, oh, that's PR spin, but they up there say, no, no, that's the truth, then all of a sudden we're in a bit of a conundrum because how do we convince you that, well, no, it's just PR spin? Uh, quite, oh, uh, that was the hand I saw first... No one would, so no one buys it. it. It's, this is the, and also, the order in which you put those bullet points mm -hmm. would those be its own spin. Like, I, I, used to run a data, I used to run a data blog of The Guardian. Like, trust me, lists of numbers are incredibly biased. <laughs> do, I show, do I show you the British crime survey, or do I show you the recorded crime numbers? Because one will tell you crime's going up, one will tell you it isn't. Which one do you want to be true? I can show you both, but... So and then you read the kinds of data and you can immediately see Essentially the a mixed media diet is the, the trick though. That's that's what you say about read the Times and read the Guardian. Yeah, do that. It's not just untruths, you know, falsehoods. You know, it's just falsehoods. You know, fake news is falsehoods, false statements, false. So so the sort of formal definition of fake news is news that's completely, completely fabricated. So a fake news claim that got about one and a half million. 
But well, I think there's a, ca- there's a sort of category yeah. thing going on with how we understand, fe- the, you know, this new concepts of it, so, yes. newly conceptualised concepts of things. So, Sorry, so sir, I, I would like to bring in a question because I, this chap's hand was up. I've got kind of two very brief questions. Yeah. The first is, how is the American media ever coming back from this? Like, how are they going to really rebuild trust and recover? Um, and the second one is kind of more for James, which is we were talking earlier about how this need to get uh, clicks and to get eyeballs over articles drives sensationalism, um, which kind of pushes towards um, uh, fake news kind of territory. But don't you solve that problem by having a subscriber-based model, whereby you're not trying to get as many eyeballs as possible in order to get generate advertising revenue, you're trying to convince people that your product is worth buying? So Briefly, and I'm afraid that's the last question, but briefly, James. So it's sort of the same those. answer to both. So yeah. it's not quite dead. You know, The New York Times and Washington Post are on an amazing journalistic run and are having a big uptick in digital subscriptions, but people are getting too optimistic about that. Despite how amazing it's been in all the digital signups, overall revenue at the New York Times is still falling. Um, I think the New York Times and Washington Post are incredibly good at catering to a certain audience, an educated, professional, largely coastal audience. And the reason that other outlets like Breitbart have stepped into the gap is that they haven't served a lot of the flyover states for a long time. And whether they try and win them back or not is their decision, but there is a commercial model. The sad thing about shutting everything off again is just at a time when we need trustworthy, open information for us all to gather at, if that's when the best stuff retreats behind walls that only people who pay for can get, we've got to leave the commons open to the worst kind of information. And so the more quality journalism that's actually out there and available to read, the better. I think that's a great note on which to to end this discussion. But um, thank you for being a wonderful audience. You're going to be in for the most amazing treat tonight. Um, I've seen the show and it's absolutely wonderful. And I can tell you a piece of gossip about Bertie Carvel, um, who plays Rupert Murdoch. So Bertie, um, I used to sit next to his dad because his dad was the social affairs editor of The Guardian. (laughs) (laughs) He ate a lot of sandwiches. And... um, (laughs) Um, John Carvel was a really splen- is a really splendid person, and he was um, the son of journal- a journalist, and I think the grandson of a journalist. And Bertie's essentially the black sheep of the family for not being a journalist. Um, so he's he's living out part of his destiny tonight. And I, my most, I used to overhear John um, speaking to Bertie over the phone when Bertie was studying. And he'd come off the phone and he'd say, Charlotte, he's never going to work. It's, gonna, it's awful. I mean, why does he want to go into the theatre? He's, you know, he'll never, he, he'll never get a job. He'll be in poverty. Anyway, I think Bertie has probably been working since the day he graduated. And he, he does a, an extraordinary, an extraordinary job um, as Rupert Murdoch. But please really join me in thanking our panel and do have a wonderful evening tonight. That's gracefully interesting.